Hello and welcome to the Central Region Science Sharing Webinar Series. Today, uh, Patrick Aide and Chauncey Schultz from NWS Bismarck will be presenting a webinar on building IDSS-driven operations based on their experience at their office. So, Patrick and Chauncey, it's all yours. All righty, thank you very much. First off, uh, everyone can hear us okay, I, I assume, and, uh, and see the screen. If not, uh, feel free to interject if... Uh, if we start to lose your or uh, your, your slides uh, fall behind. Um, we are going to be presenting on uh, what's been a, about a five or six month project, which is the uh, Biz Forecast Management Team. I, I know the, the term management caused uh, some confusion as, as whether this was meant only for management, not bargaining unit, but uh, forecast management refu uh, is uh, the phrase that, that we've coined to describe the overall forecast process, uh, the, the forecasts are over the loop. Uh, concept where we transition from just more of a grid editing focus to, uh, to you know, freeing up workforce for uh, enhanced IDSS. So hopefully, uh, you know, we filled several emails on that, but hopefully that got uh, cleared up for everyone and wanted to touch on that right off the start. Uh, we'll quickly go over the, uh, uh, the the outline of what we're going to be talking about, uh, the foundations for the overall team formation, uh, the challenges, so what the methodology actually is, uh, the, uh, the gridded forecast initialization the successes of the methodology, and what uh, future work there is. Uh, myself and Chauncey will, will tag team this uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the presentation. But the foundation for this is really uh, uh, right out of uh, the Weather Ready Nation Roadmap 2.0 and the forecaster uh, over the loop concept, which uh, we're all fairly familiar with. And it also is based off of um, phase one of uh, OWA, where um, where is our workforce currently, and this, was that matching our workload? So our current IDSS suite and messaging streams are continuing to, in, to increase, and so this is really requiring us to have a paradigm shift from our current legacy way of workload distribution to more IDSS-driven op, um, operations and building those deep uh, IDSS relationships. In order to do that, we need to free ourselves up from uh, some of the um, uh, or at least examine our, our grid editing practices and initializations and see where we can become more efficient to free up that workforce for enhanced IDSS. And like I said, you know, it's, uh, in this graphic kind of tells it well. We're, we need to turn the, the dial back, looking to turn it back where we can on grid editing and model interrogation. You know, are there strategies uh, on the technology side and the grid methodology side that can free up um, the amount of time that we have to risk assessment, crafting a consistent message uh, as part of enhanced IDSS. So this, the forecast management team is, is really uh, was a two-phase effort here at Bismarck. Um, phase one is, uh, is for the most part complete, but it's a continued iterative process of reevaluating where we are and how we can always do things better. And phase two is continued to be ongoing, which is the IDSS team. So phase one, uh, was to develop uh, an automated, uh, all-encompassing, short and long-term gridded forecast initialization that required as minimal amount of forecaster intervention as possible. So how can we design a, a short uh, and long-term grid initialization that met all the CR and national procedures and policies? How can, can we design that uh, smartly to uh, limit the amount of forecaster intervention, to free up workforce available to be fed into phase two, of the team, which was is really taking a look, a real holistic and uh, overarching uh, look at, at where are our current gaps in IDSS, you know, here at Bismarck, uh, from technology to partners across the entire board, um, and how can we utilize that workforce gain from phase one uh, to apply it to enhanced IDSS. So several challenges uh, that we have, uh, we'll go through those, uh, through most of them, and a few of them will be addressed more so in the, uh, in the um, description of the methodology itself. Um, the big one that we'll go over is staff buy-in, you know, and then leading into pace of change. And then we get further into more of the, the technical challenges of uh, model guidance and collaboration and, and the pout and how do we integrate, you know, CR extended and QPF to make sure we're, we're, we're uh, certainly in line with the rest of the region on, on those items. Um, you know, what, it should be no surprise that the biggest challenge in, in this overall process of the forecast management team isn't so much the technology and the science, it is um, staff buy-in and pace of change. You know, we, we had to build this, this common operating vision of what our goal was, 
felt the urgency, and, and this is amongst a team that's composed of diverse perspectives of where we are operationally and where we need to go. So the biggest thing that we had to do was to have multiple meetings to first address why we're pursuing this, uh, to build the buy-in, uh, to build so everyone knew what the vision was, and then continuing to reinforce that again and again in every meeting of why we're doing this. Um, and then you're making sure we're also, from a technical side, we allowed everyone to have their input into uh, the technical formation of the methodology so that the final product uh, is, yes, it's a compromise, but it's the best compromise we can have of, of varied perspectives so that what we give this the best chance of being successful by getting the most amount of buy-in from the staff. And, and again, you know, this, this is the, the most difficult part of any large paradigm shift. It's really not the technology and the science. It's, um, it's bringing a diverse group of people together on a, on a you know, a, what could be a difficult thing, which is change. So uh, the pace of change um, was another thing that we had to make sure that we controlled. Uh, it's very easy from a coding standpoint to be tinkering around all the time and, and, and hammering people with uh, all these updates over and over again of we found a tweak here and a tweak there. We really wanted to try to avoid that to have a little bit more controlled innovation process. So this whole process began in, in mid-August when we called the team together. And uh, we were uh, about two months later up and testing uh, our first uh, uh, phase of this uh, initialization on October 15th. Uh, gave it a month uh, uh, trial run, evaluated the results uh, largely based on forecaster feedback of what was working, what wasn't working, what functionality uh, did they want to have. Uh, second version by uh, early uh, December, and uh, now we've just launched uh, a, a more robust and uh, with a lot more functionality, a third version, which I, I think the, the forecaster is going to be a lot more satisfied with. And we'll go over that. Uh, coming up, but we just wanted to show the overall process, and we wanted to try to control it to make sure it was, it was iterative of, of fielding uh, feedback, uh, coming up with a solution, uh, testing it to make sure before it was deployed it was as bug-free as possible, uh, and then uh, you know, having some sort of trial period in, instead of just, you know, it was really easy. You know, I know I, I had to control myself to not want to tinker with data sets or things that weren't quite working just right because we wanted to make sure um, the things were much more controlled from an innovation standpoint. So on, on the technical side of things, some of the challenges that we really dealt with right out of the gate were model guidance. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we probably have is pop and sky, um, and especially finding a, a source of best fit for that initial grid at hour zero. What we're kind of doing in part of our process is sort of an OBS blend from the current observations into the forecast at hour one or hour two, and sort of finding a best fit for that initial grid is, is tough, especially when it comes to pop and sky. Um, secondarily, um, we really wanted to use time lag ensembles, um, especially of the rapidly updating high resolution guidance, our herd, our high res wharfs, that sort of thing. We wanted to use those as part of our forecast methodology, but the optimal choice of those time lag ensembles, really they're largely unavailable yet in GFE. Satellite tools for sky, were unstable. One of the tools that was sort of looked at right away from the team was the Sky from IR11 tool. Um, we had some success with that, but there were some tools sometimes when that particular tool didn't work at all, so it was pretty unstable. Um, as far as sort of getting past these challenges, or some of them anyway, our approach was to develop in-house time leg ensembles, um, which itself was a challenge. We had help with that from outside, uh, but we were able to create these in-house time leg ensembles to get over this. Collaboration is certainly another challenge. Um, we're testing a methodology that our neighboring offices, at least in our short-term period, are not necessarily using. And there's going to be collaboration issues with that. You can see that pretty starkly in the, the example that we've shown there. Um, and not only within our region, but we also border western region offices. And they're certainly not even doing ESTF at this point, really. They're just getting started with that. So we sort of had a lot of potential collaboration issues. So we made it very clear ahead of time um, what we were testing or what our methodology was going to be before we started, and we provided time um, with you know documentation for that sort of thing. And we've been seeking feedback from our neighboring offices to make sure that we understand how our methodology is impacting their collaboration with us. Um, we still stress to the staff here that coordinating a seamless forecast is still important, and so we still strive to meet that end goal when we're all said and done. Um, but we certainly are getting to that point in a little bit different manner um, with our in-house methodology here. 
So this is what the biz init is what we've called it. This is what the GUI looks like in the GFE procedure when you open it up. Um, you see there are three columns. The left-hand column um, gives the forecast for choices of what periods they would like to update. Uh, the default example is the full short term starting at hour zero. Uh, and in our case, the full short term is not just the ESTF period, that's maybe the first 24 hours, but all the way through until the CR extended picks up. Um, the middle column is what combination of population and probability of weather type uh, combination you'd like to use. Uh, the main one that we usually use is to populate and run pout. Uh, and in that case, that means that we're populating the forecast grids with the blends that we'll show you here coming up in a few slides. We're also running automatically the probability of weather type methodology in the background. The third column gives us the finalization choice, um, yes or no. Uh, it's probably fairly straightforward, but we'll cover that going up here as well. So the idea is really truly that we could run this init, especially on a sunny day, but even on those days that are more challenging, we could run this init, review the grids, QC them. Um, maybe there's something that, you know, collaboration leads us to make some changes. We're over the loop, but we're not sitting there and model blending, even in our very short term, even in our ESTF updates. You can see there's an option there for zero to 12 hours. When we do our ESTF, update, up, ESTF updates, most of the time now, we use the same sort of engine, the same GUI, the same procedure to do both our very near-term updates all the way out to doing our full and our short full short and long term all the way out to the CR extended. Excellent. Thank you, John. So we'll go through uh, the actual uh, blends for a, what the a 0 to 12 and 24-hour populations, which are fairly well mirrors of each other, and then what, what the full short term looks like. Um, again, all this was kind of, uh, these determining what to select for what, you know, with the primary grids, you know, temperature, winds, not the, se the secondary RH and things like that. Those are calculated later on. But this was all uh, getting the forecasters together as a group and coming to a consensus of what, uh, what do we most often use and what does the science say is the best option for each element. Uh, and with the overall arching goal, which is two-pronged, to number one, for the most part, save time, and two, uh, make sure that uh, we are not hurting our forecast from what we were doing uh, before, and uh, we've seen some improvements in uh, in some areas as well, verification-wise. Uh, so for the 12 hours, we always uh, start with the uh, six hours of observations for every field. Uh, blended to for temperatures and dew points, we're using the short blend. A lot of us saw uh, for uh, from I know Jeff Craven sent out an email towards I believe the end of last summer, showing the a fairly good verification of the short blood for T and TD. Uh, so we're using that to populate the uh, temperature and dew point uh, out through 10 hours before we blend it back to the forecast. Uh, con short for, uh, for winds, max and uh, minimum temperatures are simple derivation off the uh, uh, hourly temperature grids that we're populating. Uh, Sky, uh, right now we're, we're looking at the RTMA, URMA, which uh, you know, should have a better field, a look, but there are some issues with how long it takes to maybe get into the actual GFE for, and how useful that is. Um, and then we, one of the in-house blends that we made for Sky was uh, the Conshore TL, which is a, a time lag uh, of the ensemble of the Conshore, its last three blends, um, which we um, thought that would maybe help us, especially when it comes to digital aviation services. But, you know, when we're looking at the Sky and Top fields, any one either blend or just one actual single high res rapidly updating model, you know, it, it can be good if it's on or if it's a little off, uh, you know, it does take some adjustment. So if we can uh, time lag and use uh, multiple high res models over multiple uh, runs, uh, that seems to help us out a little bit more in handling sky cover and, and pops. Uh, QPF is also uh, utilizes the contour time lag and it's also masked with the super blend. Uh, we did this, you know, utilizing multiple runs of the con short because especially in, in the summertime, um, the, you can have very large or very high stripes of, of QPF from, uh, from convection. And if that's, it, it may shift around from run to run to run. So if we're using uh, a time lagged ensemble of multiple con short blends masked by the super blend, for, uh, that really has seemed to um, capture well um, some short-term trends that the con short may be picking up on, but you know, overall masked and within the super blend itself to really get rid of some of those high-end bullseyes uh, that may just be a little bit spurious in uh, some of the high-res modeling. Also utilizing uh, the con short time lag for POPs. Uh, we were using a, uh, a HER time lag for POPs. Uh, that, the, it, the HER performance was, uh, was just not where it, uh, we 
would have liked it to be. It was usually running a little bit too hot and putting way too many pots, especially uh, on, on days when there wasn't a whole lot of widespread precip. So the contour time lag, um, as we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation, had better uh, the best handling of POPs, especially in the first two hours, even over the con short, it was the best guidance you could get uh, for hours zero through two and had slight improvement thereafter out through about 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the zero to 24 hour blend is fairly, uh, it's pretty much a mirror of the 12 hours uh, blend, which is a short blend for uh, TD and uh, temperature, uh, getting our maximum temperatures off of uh, the populated temperatures, con short for winds and then using that uh, con short time lag for sky, QP up, and pop. So basically, uh, a mirror of the 12-hour just stretched out to, uh, to a 24-hour period. And the full short term just tacks on to the, what we, you know, that 24-hour period. So those, those 24, 0 to 24, we, from there, we, we tend to blend uh, just about everything to the super blend uh, past uh, 24 hours. Um, and we start then deriving maximum and minimum temperatures, not so much off of uh, simply looking at the hourly temperatures and picking, picking a maximum temperature, but then actually past 24 hours populating the maximum T fields directly from the super blend and running a diurnal tool uh, thereafter for hourly temperatures. Uh, regarding POPs, uh, con short time lag is, goes out to hour 22. Thereafter that, we, we try to transition to more of the global models and again more of a time lag than ensemble approach of the last two GFS, NAM, and SREF. Uh, we found this normally gives us a lot higher but it does help to address what is a rather known uh, dry bias in a lot of our POP forecasts. And if the last two runs of you know, the GFS, the NAM, the SREF are showing QPF and, and an associated POP for that area, uh, then there should be, and that, there's that much agreement, then that verifies or should lead us to putting in a higher POP there and it's something we can leverage uh, regarding collaboration. So one of the other challenges that kind of came to be when we first started uh, tinkering or using this procedure in our operations was that we would run this right around 1730 Zulu or 1830 Zulu, um, nearly at the same time the CRQPF and the extended CR extended would run. Uh, we get banners, of course, because we have those two processes crowned in our office. So we'd get a banner that the CRQPF was going to load in a few minutes. We'd get a banner that the CR extended was going to load on its own in a few minutes, and then we'd get a banner saying, hey, run our biz and knit procedure in a few minutes. So it was kind of got to be a lot of noise to the forecaster. There was sort of not one seamless approach to going from day zero through day seven in the forecast. So what we've chosen to do is sort of integrate those procedures into our biz and knit procedure. So when we run the short, full, short, and long term now, um, it actually will run the CR QPF and the CR extended initializations automatically within that. Um, we have a time check still built into our biz init procedure so that you can't run those things um, if superplan is not yet available, just like the cron initially would sort of force us to do. And then we're still doing a secondary time check um, to make sure that those CRQPF and CR extended grids do get updated in a timely manner so that we're not sitting out there in a you know loose collaboration with our neighbors. There's still something for them to look at to realize we've populated that. Um, within a certain time. So if those grids are more than 12 hours old, like say during severe weather, the cron's still going to automatically populate them. The idea here though is that the forecaster can run both the short and the long term with only really needing to do one process at one time. And that sort of guides us towards the ultimate goal, which we believe will probably be um, you know, one forecaster type of shift and one IDSS type of shift at some point, potentially, depending on what comes out of the uh, phase two of the project, the team project that we have going on here. So short term, we mentioned that we're using the probability of weather type methodology in our initialization. And in our short term, we're using that, that basically directly, except automatically. So we're populating the top down grids. For those that are familiar with it, our max T loft grids, our prob ice present grids, those sorts of things. We're populating those automatically with our NIP procedure using a time leg ensemble of the last three wrap iterations, basically for the first 12 hours. Then we're blending that to the last two NAM GFS iterations out through day four where the short term ends for us. And uh, you can see again there's a theme there where we're using sort of run legged or time legged um, member or more than one, just one model run. Um, then the probability assignments are automatically determined grid point by grid point whether to run that top down or the surface based power basically based on the max T loft that comes out of the procedure once we populate those top down grids. 
It updates the snow melt and the ice accumulation grids and merges weather, again, all automatically. It um, doesn't populate a few things. Um, and one other caveat or little note that we'd make is that we're only um, populating prob ice present grids through day two. This was something that we chose to change based on feedback through our forecast management meeting teams with all the forecasters here. And it really the review showed that when we did this automated probability of weather type procedure, when we had those prob ice present grids in there more than about a day out, we got way too much freezing rain into being introduced, especially on day three and on, um, due to low prob ice present grids, probably due to the fact that we had limited model guidance in those points. So we had collaboration issues, and in some cases, it kind of made a little bit more work for us, because we'd have to go back back in and manually rerun the pout when we needed to to take out those freezing rain things. Taking this out so that we don't populate prob ice present beyond this period now um, has kind of eased those things quite a bit and again gotten us back onto the point we want to be which is you know less manual work in the grids. So the other thing that we've done with the uh, short-term pout is the pot blowing snow grids. Um, we're actually calculating the blowing snow um, grids using the blowing snow prob output from the Bagley or Bagali blowing snow model, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, that's based on research from Environment Canada that essentially calculates the probability for blowing snow, reducing the visibility to less than a half mile. Um, GFE genius Tommy Graffenauer, the Sioux and Grand Forks, coded this up for us. Works really well. Um, it's based on snow age. Um, temperatures, that sort of thing, whether you have snowfall um, or snow on the ground. So we're using that model in the background, again, automatically through our initialization procedure to populate our pot blowing snow grids as well. So then in the long term, uh, as far as the probability weather type methodology goes in the long term, we're only using the surface T. We're not populating the top-down grids in our in the real CR long term. We're not populating, for instance, a max T loft grid. We're just using the surface based probability of weather type. So in other words, we're using a surface temperature threshold of 34 or 37 to determine whether we have snow or rain. We're still populating and merging snow melt and ice accumulating accumulations in the long term, and we're merging the weather. Finally, we're still also doing our fire weather grids through this init procedure. Um, we're populating, calculating all the fire weather grids when we run the full short term or the full short and long term time range. And for our fire weather grids, we're essentially using the NAM 12 data, at least at this point. For snow ratio within our initialization procedure, we're using a multi-model, multi-technique method. We're essentially using the snow ratio blender tool that's on the SCP um, as the backbone of our procedure here. Um, and what it does is we're using GFS, NAM, and RAP guidance, and we're applying it to the COB, the Air Force, or the Max-T loft method, the ROBER, which we get from WPC, and then a surface T method, which is not as scientific, but sort of serves as a check and balance on our process. And then we're blending that with a seasonal climate logical ratio, again, to get a, both a multi-model and multi-techniques method in there. And then finally, we're reducing ratios uh, for grid points with greater than 36, regardless of what comes out of that initial output, to sort of draw the ratios down much lower for marginal temperature uh, profiles. All righty. And uh, finally, it's finalization, which is very simply just consistency of uh, temperature uh, TD, wind gust, QPF, a very standard tools, and then just to uh, make sure, especially for the extended, all the grids are stretched out where they need to be, and we're then recalculating those secondary derived grids like RH, maximum RH, and apparent temperature. Again, all using standard tools and procedures. Um, and that has been an absolute fire hose probably coming at you regarding what uh, is the overall science and blends that go into um, uh, biz and NIT. Uh, but we wanted to show you uh, quickly, you know, that the time we took to, to make a very robust and all-encompassing methodology that is powered by one GUI that you, all you have to do is make three choices and click one button. Powerful tools and a lot of thought science that goes, that is in the background of what we tried to make the most simplest looking GUI possible for, for the forecasters. Um, and we had successes, which is a good thing. So we'll go over some of the successes uh, of the forecast management team, and then we can open it up uh, to, well, first, then future work after that, and then questions for everybody. Um, digital aviation. Uh, yeah, Bismarck, we've been doing this for about a year and a half or so, digital aviation, where it's been growing in, in the amount of forecasters that are adopting it, and uh, we just about have everyone trained up and using it. Uh, but we introduced it as a non-mandatory supplement to the overall forecast uh, management methodology. Uh, we have seen improved IFR verification scores 
and that's uh, been coincident with the increased use of DAS in the office. Um, and the forecasters like it. Uh, digital aviation, uh, many people say it's a large time saver, it's a natural fit, in, and myself and others say it really helps to improve our actual recognition of avi aviation hazards by looking at things uh, on, on a over a plain view gridded scale than, than focusing just on uh, single points, uh, which will become more important as we move into DAS where we're not focusing just on points but on the overall aerial spatial coverage of aviation hazards. Um, the contour time lab, uh, this is Chauncey's uh, 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 handiwork here, so I think I'll let him uh, explain what the contour time lag uh, is, is generally all about and, and what is its success been. Thanks, Patrick. So, con short time leg, uh, we developed this originally as an alternative to the her time leg, which we had, uh, Patrick had originally developed over the summer, last summer as a, a first kind of look at this. Um, and we kind of decided, well, maybe we're overweighting the her solutions a little bit and laying a few other guidance sources that are still pretty good, we're sort of leaving them on the floor. So, we went back and said, what if we time leg our con short guidance? And we did that, and it's using the last several runs, um, weighting them um, so that the most recent run gets about 40% weighting, and the few le least recent run gets about 5% rating in any weighting in any given time leg run. And what we've noticed once since we've been running con short time leg for about the last oh, 60 days or so is significant improvement in the hour zero to hour two pops over all the guidance, including con short, the base con short, um, and still a slight improvement thereafter. Uh, we're continuing to investigate the impacts on uh, digital aviation services because one of the reasons we originally went down the route of coming up with a con short time leg was the hypothesis that this would really help us with our aviation grid. Uh, sometimes we would see, especially with some, some of the high-res wharf guidance, which isn't in the con short anymore for aviation grids anyway, but we would see some of these things that there would be sort of splotches. It was hitting the IFR things quite a bit. So we thought, well, what if we use con short time leg to sort of smooth though give us a real signal, uh, would that lead to fewer lines generated by the format or would it lead to a more accurate forecast? We're still working on investigating whether that hypothesis is, is true, but we certainly have seen an improvement in our POPs with this. Okay, thank you, Chauncey. And one thing that I think uh, we're also working on is you know, when we developed the herd time lag last year, it was not only the last three runs, but it would look back and forth an hour to look in, in the averaging of that, and that's something we also want to we talk with uh, Jerry from uh, Milwaukee uh, a little bit about, um, you know, I think that's an optimal thing, especially for convection in regards to POPs, is not only averaging over the last three runs, but looking ahead and backwards an hour, um, because there could be also not only a spatial error, but also a temporal error when uh, those models are generating convection. Um, okay, this is all, like we said, a lead into phase two, which is the IDSS team. Uh, this and it has proven to be a time saver, and uh, it has gained buy-in uh, through the uh, fairly iterative process much more robust, make it more flexible, and it has freed up significant workforce uh, to be dedicated to enhance IDSS, which the IDSS team, which is phase two, is continuing to work on uh, what exactly that IDSS program looks like, what are the gaps that we need to train on, with the goal of hopefully sometime this summer, and, uh, and probably at the latest this fall, where we shift, at least hope, at least on the day shift, we'll have to look at, at, the, at the other shifts uh, across the clock, but at least they shift all forecast duties transfer to one forecaster and one forecaster assigned strictly to IDSS, which is a model that's already been employed, uh, I know, at some offices across the region. Um, model guidance, some external, uh, some future work that we need on the, the model guidance uh, is, uh, like we touched on before in the challenges, is that um, we need the, the data sets that uh, in GFE to catch up to where the NWP science is. So have, have unlagged ensembles and neighborhood probabilities be readily ingested so that we're not having to make them in-house, which is a challenge and can lead to uh, errors popping up. Uh, it's a lot easier if we can just pull something without having to actually calculate it in-house. Uh, we, we looked at neighborhood probabilities, but man, they are very expensive computationally uh, to produce at a local level and just really not feasible to, at this time. Um, we, we tried it. Chauncey's looked at it a little bit. It's, it's very uh, expensive. It, it, by the time they, they're out and, and produced, it's an hour later, and it's just not, not usable. Um, also, better first guess pops from radar. Uh, and then where's the National Blend of Models going to take us? How is GOZAR going to, uh, and it's 
fields that would be fed into the high-res up, rapidly updating fields, how is that going to hopefully help us uh, with some of the, the model guidance challenges that, that we currently have? One of the challenges that we've discovered from a forecast side of things is high pop, low QPF events. Um, it turns out that the rapidly updating high resolution guidance seems to really struggle with shallow precipitation, these high pop, low QPF events. We get a lot of these during wintertime in particular. Um, so questions being, you know, is this an artifact of the precipitation not being well sampled by the radar um, or is it something else? Regardless, these type of events usually are the one kind of one of the areas in particular that actually requires more significant forecast or intervention to the POPs and the QPF from after what the init gives us. And don't get us wrong, when, when we get the init, we've always stressed a, you know, forecaster over the loop concept. So we're always QCing, reviewing the grids, and we're adjusting them as needed. Um, but it turns out that this is one of those type of events that really needs adjusting more often than not. And one of the things we want to explore in the future is if there's a better first guest initialization to sort of take out some of that extra work that we've had to do in these type of situations. Alrighty, digital aviation. Uh, there's both internal and external improvements. Internal, you know, the goal is to integrate digital aviation fully into the forecast management process. Um, having uh, BAS grids uh, being updated hourly in the background for ease of amendments. So, you know, it, we're not. If something needs to be amended, you know, trying to shift from just amending an avian FTS to amending the actual grid, and and that will kind of evolve as DAS evolves across the region and, and, and nationally as well. And also the mindset that, that digital aviation, uh, you know, it's part of forecast management and digital aviation is not just GP TAPs, it is, a whole, it is uh, aviation over the entire grid space. But one of the biggest challenges within digital aviation and the forecast management was always the initial conditions, highly dependent not only on sky, but uh, a good visibility and a good uh, cloud-based primary ceiling grid, um, it was it's still a challenge. And hopefully, you know, the RTMA, URMA, and eventually GOES-R will uh, certainly help us with that. Um, regarding the POUT, we want to develop, we're looking to develop a, a smarter way to, uh, to populate max t lock Chauncey, I know you, you want to touch on that. I think you've been, you've, uh, you've had quite a hand in that. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've discovered is sometimes we have these events where we have light precipitation that occurs uh, with a, a, a warm layer of loft that's not necessarily fully saturated, so it doesn't wet bulb all the way down to what the wet bulb temperature, which might be below freezing. Um, so we're looking at developing a smarter way to sort of populate that max T loft based on the thermal and the moisture characteristics of the profile, such that if we have these events with a really warm layer of loft, but it's dry, if we have light precipitation that something that we get sort of on the leading edge of a warm frontal boundary or it could be the leading edge of a greater, more significant precipitation event in other parts of the country too. Um, so we're kind of looking, is there a way to sort of weight the max T aloft with the max T sub W, the wet bulb temperature aloft, um, based on the max RH in that warm layer? Um, so we're sort of working on that down the road because there's probably some way to more intelligently initialize that. Um, another thing that we're working on and sort of dabbling with perhaps for next year is to use the Metro Road model, which is developed by Environment Canada, uh, for the road temperature grids in GFE, which are part of the probability of weather type as well. And then Pop Severe, I'll let Patrick speak to that a little bit. Sure, yeah. Uh, we're, one thing we're, we're uh, trying to, to investigate uh, is we're going to have looking for one more update to the, the overall bid in it for the summer because uh, right now uh, being that we entered into winter, we, we kind of ignored thunder uh, and uh, for now, but we're going to be revisiting that here, especially in the coming weeks. Uh, one of the things we want to look at is uh, creating uh, pot severe, which would um, more intelligently and automatically add T-plus to the grids um, based on uh, certain environmental parameters and thresholds. I think that uh, the initial approach that we want to take is using fairly simple shape or uh, cape and shear profiles, uh, get that maybe off the ground, and then maybe look at some of the CAM guidance and the near storm environmental parameters um, and, and looking at if, how can we utilize those fields for determining uh, when to flip you know, a grid from T to T plus. Um, that may take a little bit more work, especially because uh, some of the CAMs, it, it's, you get these stripes of say high updraft helicity where the storm is in the model and that, if that's off from where it's actually going to be, you know, Maybe a neighborhood probability approach is a little bit better, but that takes more computation. So we're looking for uh, to you know to maybe look at pot severe to have a 
have an, an element within the pout flip us from T to T plus uh, automatically based on the environment. Um, and we're looking at do we want to, you know, how do we handle surface space versus elevated convection? Well, we also are, are going to build in a check to make sure we're not adding something outside of uh, where SPC has this outlook so that we're maintaining that consistency from the local right on up to the national level. Um, and uh, that, you, there's also more work in regards to snow ratio, which uh, is uh, completely Chauncey's, uh, of Chauncey's uh, work from when he was over in Billings. So I'll let him talk about that. Um, he's highly biased to it because it's, it's good work that he's done. So there's certainly more work to do on the snow ratio front. Now, a big one is probably um, including a factor to reduce the SLR with increasing forecast wind speed. There's really None of the methods directly account for that. Rover should account for that a little bit that we get from WPC, but we're not positive how much wind is actually being accounted for in the neural network that's being run there. We really want to reduce the SLR with increasing forecast wind speed, again, the hourly forecast wind grids that we have in there. We want to utilize time lagged model data to make it more consistent with our approach for the rest of our pout grids. And we probably want to build a smarter weighting of the techniques based on the verification and the environmental characteristics so that we know if Cobb is doing very well or if the Air Force method is doing really well in certain circumstances, it intelligently weights those. And then we want to blend 10% official into our results too to sort of make it consistent again with the rest of our methodology that we've used for our developing our gridded initialization set. Fire weather, um, we're also looking again to sort of go back and revisit fire weather as we approach the warm season. And we want to use one leg model output. We're sort of tied to the NAM 12 when it comes to our fire weather grid because we just don't get enough of the other grid to truly develop mixing height grids that mean something. So we're sort of tied to the NAM 12, but at least very least we could use more than one NAM 12 model run, a run leg type of thing to sort of build a better consensus forecast with our fire weather grids. We want to ensure inner element consistency. Um, in other words, is our transport wind at least as high as our surface wind? Because that's not something that's necessarily checked in our current forecast process. And then we're in the early stages of exploring better techniques to derive the first guess grids, like mixing height and transport winds, uh, mixing height perhaps based on total kinetic energy, TKE, or transport winds perhaps based just off of our surface wind forecast, which we know we have better first guess grids for. And that would, source, of course, ensure our consistency. So we're just sort of in the early stages of exploring those things. All righty, last slide. Uh, and that is just a collaboration. Um, and one of the big things, especially here at, at Bismarck, is that we uh, uh, border Western region. So uh, it, it's always a challenge, especially when uh, the regions have differing uh, uh, procedures for uh, in, uh, initializing the grids. And that is a challenge, is the, the cross-regional boundaries of how do we maintain or deal with collaboration uh, uh, across boundaries, uh, not only at a WFO level, but also uh, at a regional level. And at that, I will, uh, I will say that is all we have. And uh, we will take uh, as many questions as, as there are. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was uh, an excellent presentation. And uh, if you have a question, you can either put it in the question and answer part of the uh, GoToWebinar software, uh, or uh, you can uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, go to... Hey, John, I think we're unmuted. Oh, okay, good. I'm gl uh, glad you are. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Jim Sivakin, go ahead. Jim, are you there? Okay, well, I'll go ahead and answer, ask the question. He said, this is simply fantastic. I hope you are working with the Upper Mississippi River Valley Sioux community and CRG Matt, because I know they are also working these exact issues. Together, you are you all could come up with a great init for all of us to use. Thank you for sharing this. So oh, that was a nice comment. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, We've, uh, we presented this uh, a couple weeks ago to uh, uh, Andy Just and Dan Barnard of ARX, who are uh, big into the uh, central region grid methodology. And we've been working uh, quite cl closely with a lot of the development and things and keeping uh, Jerry uh, uh, Wiedenfeld over at MKX also in the loop of what we are. So, you know, uh, you know the one of the main things that we wanted to do out of all this is to 
um, help shape the future. And you know, is, are we the final answer? Maybe we're not. But you know, we uh, if we're all you know, what we're learning has been fed to Andy and the CRG Matt to help have influence and to shape what the uh, uh, what the future is of. Uh, of what we're working on and uh, and forecast operations. So we've definitely uh, not tried to keep this to ourselves, but but share it as much as we can to make sure we're keeping, especially um, a lot of the key players in the Sierra grid methodology in the loop on what we're doing. Thank you. And Jim says, fantastic. <laughs> uh, Ken Cook, you had a question. Yeah, I've got two questions asked, actually. Um, the first is, uh, with the digital aviation, during, I'm just kind of wondering, how does that perform during, you know, busy weather situations with convection and winter weather ongoing, and how does that affect your workload? That that's my, does it make it go up or down? That's my first question. Um, what I can say is, from a, a convectively, I think it is uh, is definitely a time saver. Um, I think it's a time saver for both situations. First, for convection, you know, we were utilizing, uh, starting to utilize pretty heavily a lot of those time lagged ensembles, which are giving us pretty good pop fields. Um, and that was being, and you're starting with, you're starting with good grids, and so the formatter is going to spit out something that's fairly intuitive and centers on those two or three hours where thunderstorms are actually um, going to be near or approaching the terminals. So I, I think we've seen a big time save there. Um, and we'll continue to investigate that, especially this summer as we uh, have just about all the forecasters spun up on digital aviation. So when those, you know, for expect, you know, those big systems, like winter systems, um, it, mm -hmm. it continues to be a time saver. Those are usually handled fairly well by, uh, by digital aviation, by the blends, getting the low strata, the low visibilities, um, the widespread precipitation shields, where it's a little bit of a struggle, it's a smaller scale, uh, winter events where little pockets of freezing rain or a little bit of fog here and there, which where the blends are uh, have a little bit harder time picking up on. So that that adds a little time. Um, you know, I, there has been a lot of talk on uh, the digital aviation back and forth. And today, at the most, it's 15 minutes, uh, much less. And on a really busy day, yeah, you know, I'd say at the most it's a half an hour. But most times, it's still way less than that because in those big weather situations, mm -hmm. you know, big winter storms. Uh, the blends handle very well the the fog or the, the stratus and and uh, the uh, the low visibilities or if there's a widespread fog and stratus bank those are handled very well. Where your time sinks start to creep in a little bit is is on the not so busy weather days where it's but where you got kind of those smaller scale pesky little uh, you know pockets of freezing rain or fog where the blends tend to not pick up as well or, or as easy. Sure. And I don't know, Chauncey, if you got any yeah. answers. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why it sort of ends up being a time saver for us in a lot of cases is by the way that we've designed our normal shift duties right now so that the person that's doing the ASTF update is also doing the aviation grid. So it sort of ties in. You're already looking at the problem if there is a problem. Um, and so it sort of saves a little bit of time in that regard. Um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed just operationally, like Patrick mentioned, a lot of times if we have these fog events or something like that, that's not a big system. Sometimes the blends especially tend to be too pessimistic with some of those cases, and it takes a little bit more work to get something in the grids and then into the tasks that you really, that you really would like. And I think what I just All right. Said, no, go ahead. I was just going to say thanks for the feedback. It's, you know, we're not really spun up on it yet, and I, I was just curious that and so I really appreciate that feedback. I think it's, you know, it was kind of I like... I did have a... So no, go ahead. I, I'll, I'll go after you. I, I had a second question I wanted to have, but if you guys have more about that, I didn't want to stop you, interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Go ahead. Okay, my second question was about the pot severe. And, um, you know, uh, one of our GFE guys has been been trying to do something similar to that for a while. And I was just wondering, is there a way that uh, we, we as our region or whoever could work together, uh, the GMAT team, whoever with SPC, to just be able to ingest um, their outlook grids and determine when a good cutoff is to put a uh, T plus in the grid so that we're internally consistent and externally consistent. I think um, we can can we can talk answer that on our end. We got we we have a uh, on our. Threat matrix or enhanced DHWO, which is a little bit different from what the, the Springfield version is. Our 
goes over the whole state. We are ingesting into GFP the actual uh, SBC outlooks and the associated um, you know day one probabilities for hail, wind, and tornado. Um, I think what we're trying to do is you know in that big time block which the the outlook covers, how do we chop that up to only put T plus in for three or four hours compared to a whole day you know, you know, where the, the oh, outlook okay. covers. I see. Um, but we, we, we are ingesting that as part of our threat matrix uh, into GFE. Uh, but you know the thing is how do we how do we intelligently pick a smaller window when we need to flip things to T plus and and but still okay. maintain be consistent of what, you know so that over the whole day we're not putting T plus where there's not, not something from SPC. He's also trying to work on that problem too of trying to dip, you know, break down their outlooks a little bit of highlighting more smaller time ranges when there's actually going to be severe, not only over the whole valid time of the day one and two product. All right. Well, listen, thanks. I appreciate all your hard work. It's really great. And, you know, just keep, keep going, keep pushing. So thanks. Sounds good. And one thing I was going to add about digital aviation there, Ken, is um, you know, it's like, like when we developed or took on the POUT. It, it, uh, it can be a little daunting. Uh, it's not as daunting as the POUT if, if, you, are, if you guys use that at all. But um, we've, uh, we've got a lot of good documentation experience. If you need help, feel free to contact us. But it's really, once you get in there, it looks daunting, but it's really, really not as bad as it looks. It's really fairly intuitive and, and pretty simple. So uh, we, we, we love it here. Yeah, I mean, we've been kind of generating some of that stuff, and I, I, it looks really easy. I, I mean, I've worked on it some. I'm just, you know, during these freezing drizzle situations, because we've had a lot of that nonsense. But I don't want to dominate the comments conversation. I'm, there's plenty of other people out there that want to ask things smarter than me. So thanks a lot. I, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, thanks, Ken. And uh, we had a comment from uh, Southern Region. It reads, uh, please discuss the local office philosophy with regard to interactions with national centers. For example, it sounds like you are developing homegrown methods to populate pot severe grids. You mentioned that you are checking to make sure you don't conflict with SPC. SPC pr produces severe prob forecast, uh, why don't you just start with that in the day one to three period? And I know you may have covered some of this, but I wanted to get that comment out there, the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know that did come up a little bit in our last conversation. But, yeah, the idea is to start from those SPC outlooks. Really, that's probably will be a, that's our starting point. I'm going to go back down to a smaller time frame. And obviously, SPC is working on this as part of ultimately, you know, the facets project coming down the road. I know SPC and their hazardous weather test bed is trying to figure out how to do this sort of thing as well. Uh, but we thought, what can we maybe start to do on our end to sort of guide that process to get our mindset in that too, that even though the day one outlook is, is a good outlook and we're going to start from that, we maybe don't want severe in that whole 24-hour period. Maybe we still have thunderstorms on the back end of it, but we understand that it's, you know, lightning within the stratiform rain shield or something like that. Exactly, and it gets into you know as we get into more graphics or you know the hourly weather forecast things like that of you know when you know ha instead of having a, a large time frame of T plus if we can narrow that down for our user which feeds indirectly into IDSS um, uh, in which what we're this is all being built for is, is to to feed into enhanced IDSS operations. Okay, um, we have a question from Mike Fowle. Mike, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. This is uh, Mike from Des Moines. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, kind of going back to Ken Cook's point, and it's something I brought up on the uh, DAS call uh, a while back. Overall, I think we've been just dabbling with the DAS as well here. I think overall the forecasters, even out of the box, have been fairly impressed with the grids. The problem we've had is more with the formatter. It kind of gives us odd breakdowns of when it's, you know, additional lines or, or strange uh, times, you know, when it gives you different wind speeds. So we've spent a lot of time QCing that. Have you guys dabbled with the formatter, or have you had those same sort of issues? Thanks. No, we've, uh, we've uh, intentionally not dabbled with the formatter because we didn't, don't want to, um, to touch you, to we want to feed the, the any feedback that we have for the formatter to the developers instead of tinkering on our end 
and then having it overwritten uh, anytime there's a new update or, or being out of line with with, with uh, regional uh, standard procedures. Uh, one, you know, we, we have experienced that as well, where you, sometimes, where you get often you know, too many lines than you need. I think a lot of the forecasters here overwhelmingly say it's a lot easier to rip out a couple lines uh, here and there. Uh, and because the benefit is it's such a, a significant time savings of getting you to uh, those formatted tasks and also building up your uh, aviation hazard recognition that the benefits far away just having to delete a few lines. And I know uh, that the developers are working hard to continually to develop better ways to, to make that format or better. But then, you know, we've experienced that, but I think a lot of the forecasters see that there's so much benefit to it, um, and it, it's increased our verification scores, it's increased our situational awareness of aviation hazards, that it's easy to delete a couple lines that, that really are duplicates or shouldn't be in there. Um, you know, some of it is just unfortunately um, the way things are, are kind of hard in aviation based on the flight categories, the few alternates, the airport minimums that, um, are, that you know, that's kind of where we were going with the con short time lag is if we can smooth out some of these changes in the cloud cover, uh, maybe we bounce around less between all the flight categories and airport minimums and few alternates um, to hopefully limit some of the lines in the tap. If we can maybe you know, maybe it's part on the formatter and maybe part on the grids to smooth things out so that we're not continually kind of waffling between the flight categories. All right, thanks for the comment. Uh, I think that's what we've seen as well. I guess the, the, at least the feedback I've been given in, in the times I've worked shift, which isn't all that often, is that that's where the time sync has come in. And we've actually seen cases where what's given you in the formatter lines is not what's actually in the grids. There's times where, uh, and I, again, I brought all this stuff and passed this feedback along, but that's where the time sink has come in, as, as Ken was referring to. So that's something I think is beyond what you guys are doing. I was just curious if you had made any changes to that, because that's where we found there takes a little effort is to actually make sure what the grids uh, and the format are, are uh, in cahoots with one another. And at times, it seems like right now they are not. So, Sure, but, Mike, uh, thanks if you want to uh, email me, uh, after the call, um, there may be a couple things that come to mind that uh, that I would maybe want to double check to to make sure because we noticed that too. If you had, um, on our end, and we we kind of found errors in our ways of why that was occurring. So maybe you know we'll get together after the call and and uh, and see uh, and see if we can help out or you know just a few things come to my mind that maybe we can talk with after the call. So if that works for you. Uh, thank you, yeah, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, comment from Andy Edmond in Western Region. Nice work, and thanks for the presentation. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's see if we can go to uh, Ken Johnson. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ken Johnson, Eastern Region SSD. Um, thanks for the presentation, and uh, uh, you did a really great job in presenting this material. Uh, just one quick comment. Uh, this seems to be similar to some work being done at our Sterling office, the Baltimore Washington office. Uh, they're, they're doing, since October they had been doing some more or less forecaster over the loop or forecast management uh, work. And uh, I think it might be interesting if uh, somehow you all got together and compare notes. So um, I'm going to let them know that you're doing this work and uh, you, you may get be contacted by them. So uh, thanks, thanks for the pre presentation. Very informative. And by uh, all means, we'd welcome that. We've been working quite a few with uh, the, the offices that are big into the grid methodology and shaping that uh, in, in our region. But uh, you know, it's no reason why we can't cross boundaries and, and come to a uh, consensus solution together. So that'd be great. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, any other uh, last-minute questions? Very good. Well, uh, Chauncey and Patrick, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today and being willing to share your knowledge and all the work you've done. Uh, great job. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate the opportunity. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email us, call us, uh, by all means. Thank you, and we'll see you all later. Bye-bye.